<clears throat> this presentation entitled Living on the Edge of Doubt is intended to address one of the major problems that our community faced when it started and indeed a problem that we still face today. <clears throat> We've looked at some of the doubts that we naturally feel as followers of Christ and believers in the Bible. Doubts concerning evidence for the Bible's claims. And doubts concerning the, the uh, textual transmission of the Old and New Testament. And I'd like to look now at one of the doubts which maybe plagues us occasionally and which is certainly been thrown at us uh, as a challenge by other Christians since our community started. And that is the fact that we are in many ways living on the edge of Christianity. We know that our collection of beliefs is highly marginal within Christianity. Uh, I described it here as being on the edge of Christianity. We know that we're a very small Christianity. We are smaller than some of the smallest splinter groups of some of the major sects and denominations in Christianity. So we know we're a tiny witness to gospel truth. And it is a challenge for us to approach others with our understanding of the gospel being such a small community. And the challenge thrown at us is, well, how can you be right and all these other people be wrong? about the gospel. How is it possible for such a tiny scrappy little group such as you to be right when millions of Christians could be wrong about their understanding of the Bible? So I'd like to address that this morning. <clears throat> Firstly I'm going to look at the fact that we are on the edge of Christianity. We are a very marginal group within the broader Christian community. I, look, I like to look at how our earliest brothers dealt with that challenge, and they addressed it head on. Secondly, I'd like to look at the fact that, in fact, throughout the history of Christianity, our beliefs have been held by other Christians. So it's not that we have come up with something new, or that we have disco discovered something that nobody else could discover throughout the entire history of Christianity. That's not true, and that's certainly not what our earliest brothers said either. And that's an important point because we believe that our understanding of the gospel is accurate and we also believe that faithful Bible students could gain that same understanding themselves just by reading the Bible. And being able to find historical witnesses to our beliefs throughout the history of Christianity proves that our beliefs are not something we invented ourselves but that faithful Bible students could actually learn the gospel by themselves by reading the Bible. And thirdly, I'd like to look at some modern scholarly literature on biblical interpretation and see what that has to say and see how modern scholars are in fact coming around to more of the same view of the gospel that we hold ourselves. And I, I think you will find that of some interest. So let's look firstly at this challenge, at the fact that we, as a tiny little Christian sect, have a unique set of beliefs and the challenge of what is going to happen when, when a Christian comes to us and says, well, how can you be right when millions of other Christians, apparently, according to you, haven't got the right understanding of the gospel? And this is the challenge which was thrown at our, our earliest members. So, Brother Roberts, who wrote the book Christendom Astray, a book which openly challenged all other Christians and said, well, this is a book that I've written to explain why I believe all of you are wrong. He said, this is the problem that we face. Do you mean to say, asks the incredulous inquirer, that the Bible has been studied by men of learning for 18 centuries without being understood? And that the thousands of clergymen and ministers set apart for the very purpose of ministering in its holy things are all mistaken? And Brother, Tom, Brother Roberts acknowledged that this is a legitimate question because the claim we have that we are right and so many other people are wrong does sound like an extreme claim. It really does sound extraordinary. That we as a tiny little group, and of course in the 19th century we were even much, much smaller, numbering only at first in the hundreds of people, it really is extraordinary to try and, and present this claim to, to uh, somebody belonging to a denomination of millions of Christians that the Bible has been studied for all this time and that people keep on getting it wrong and then finally we came along and we got it right. 
Well, Brother Robert said, well, that, that's not exactly true. That's not exactly what I'm arguing for. And <clears throat> Brother Robert said, well, actually, what we believe, we don't believe that the true gospel was completely and utterly lost when the apostles died and then only completely recovered when, when Brother Thomas came along and rediscovered everything. Certainly, we believe that Brother Thomas rediscovered the truth for himself and he assisted others in its rediscovery. But Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts never taught that the true understanding of the gospel had been completely lost throughout that time. And that's important because they believed that the Bible was sufficient witness of itself that Christians between the time of the apostles and the 19th century could actually gain a true understanding of the gospel by studying, its, by studying the pages of the Bible. And if we believe that the Bible is a sufficient witness to itself, then we will believe that other Christians throughout history could have gained the same understanding as ourselves by studying the Bible faithfully if they put aside the teachings that they had been given by the churches. And Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts both believed this and they both taught it. <clears throat> So Brother Thomas wrote, Hence, the gospel promised in the prophets is the gospel Jesus preached. And the same gospel that was preached by the apostles in his name after his ascension, and the same gospel that has been confessed by all true believers for the past 1800 years. So Brother Thomas did believe that from the time of the apostles through to his own day, there had been true believers who preached the one gospel that Jesus preached, and who preached the, the one gospel that the apostles preached in the name of Christ. Now, Brother Thomas acknowledged that those believers had very, been very small in number during that time and had been certainly eclipsed by the apostasy of the churches. And yet he believed that true followers of Jesus and true believers in the gospel had existed for the past 18 years. He never claimed that God had raised him up uniquely and given him special divine insight so that he could recover the news, the good news of the gospel, which no one else had managed to gain throughout that 1800 years. He never believed that or taught it. And Brother Roberts likewise. He said, though the apostles died, their work continued. And the generation of believers that went to the grave with them were succeeded by other believers who maintained the integral structure of the temple of God founded in Europe. So Brother Roberts likewise believed that after the apostles died, the true gospel was maintained by a few small believers, a few small number of believers throughout that time up to the age of Brother Thomas. And yes, Brother Roberts says, true, the work was marred and corrupted by the apostasy of the mass. Still, a real work, a real temple existed, consisting of the remnant of true believers preserved by God as his witnesses in the midst of the prevailing corruption. So it's important to note that neither Brother Thomas nor Brother Roberts believed that the gospel had been completely lost after the apostles' time, and that God had miraculously raised up Brother Thomas and given him special divine insight and inspiration so that he could recover the gospel which nobody else had been able to understand for 1800 years. They didn't believe that, they never taught that, and they taught the complete opposite. They, all, they both believed and they taught that throughout that time, true believers, though very small in number, had been able to read the Bible for themselves and that the Bible, being a sufficient witness unto itself, had taught those true believers and those diligent Bible students, the true gospel. And even though that gospel was, and, and those, that small number of believers was heavily obscured by the number of the apostasy, they believed that true believers had existed during that time. Now the next challenge, of course, is that if we believe, as, as we do, that the gospel was understood and believed by people, by men and women who faithfully read the Bible and were able to understand it for themselves, then we should be able to look through the pages of history and find those people. So we should be able to find throughout that time, throughout that 1800 years, we should be able to find historical witnesses who believed the same understanding of the gospel that we do. Now Christadelphians have actually spent some time investigating history and looking for such believers. Two works in particular, or well, two authors in particular, have been 
devoted to this question. Brother Alan Eyre wrote two books. So, sorry, <clears throat> I've written both of the protesters. One of them was called Brethren in Christ, and one of them was called The Protesters. And Sister Ruth McAfee wrote a, a work much later, Finding Founders and Facing Facts. Brother Alan Eyre's two books, Brethren in Christ and The Protesters, did find a certain number of believers throughout history who held the same beliefs as ourselves. However, Sister Ruth McAfee's book, written in 2001, investigated a number of Brother Alan's clear, uh, Brother Alan Eyre's claims and found that they were wanting. She found that <clears throat> he had either misunderstood or misrepresented some of his sources, and in fact, his works could not be relied on to provide an accurate depiction of the existence of true believers throughout that time. It's also true that, that Sister Ruth McAfee, in, in her enthusiasm, actually misrepresented some of her own sources and, and didn't provide enough information to really balance the picture either. And so, if, if you've heard of these works, it's important to understand their strengths and weaknesses. Sister Ruth McAfee acknowledged that Brother Alan Eyre had uncovered a certain amount of evidence demonstrating that some of our beliefs had been held by earlier Christians throughout that 1800 years, but also demonstrated some of the weaknesses of this investigation. And likewise, Sister Ruth McAfee's own work is marred by some weaknesses and some failings of her own. So it's important to understand that these are the two primary works in our community written on these subjects, or rather the three primary works, and both of them have their strengths and weaknesses. Now I was aware of this when I started investigating this this question for myself. I read all three works and I compared them with each other. And then when I started investigating this, this subject for myself, what I did is instead of conducting my own personal research, because I didn't have access to all of these primary resources, and because I knew that, that as a Christadelphian I'm also biased, what I did when I started looking at this question was I looked at secular literature, I looked at non-religious literature, and I looked at professional historians who have investigated this question. And so when I started looking at this question, I didn't look at Christadelphian books. I looked at professional historians and the works of scholars who have actually investigated this particular issue and have looked at marginal Christianity, as it's called, and marginal Christian beliefs. And I investigated this from the relevant professional scholarly literature so I could be sure that firstly that the literature I was reading didn't have an, did not have a Christadelphian bias, and also that the literature I was reading had been reviewed and examined carefully by other professionals and had been verified and validated, so I could be sure that the literature I was reading and the sources I, were read, I was reading were actually accurate and were agreed by, the, by other scholars to be accurate. And what I'd like to show to you this morning is evidence for historical witnesses throughout that 18 year, 1800 years of other Christians who held our same beliefs. Other Christians, for example, who held the same understanding of us as human on human mortality, who did not accept the immortality of the soul. Other Christians throughout that period who understood God and Jesus as we do, as we do, who, do who did not accept the Trinity and who did not accept the pre-existence of Jesus. Other Christians who held the same understanding of the atonement that we do throughout that time, few in number, yes, but who still understood the atonement as we do today. And remarkably, even other Christians and in fact even earlier Jewish witnesses who understood the subject of Satan and demons as we do ourselves. So I'd like to show you now this morning some of these historical witnesses of other Christians who throughout that time held the same beliefs as we do on these subjects. The immortality of the soul was one of the most dominant doctrines of the apostasy throughout that 1800 years. But despite its dominance, certain early Jewish writers and especially even a, a surprising number of Christian writers held the correct understanding the belief which is called conditional immortality, that humans are not innately immortal and that immortality is a gift granted by God only at the resurrection of the dead at the judgment of Christ. <clears throat> 
This was held by a number of early and late medieval Jewish scholars. And most importantly, it was also held throughout the entire length of time of Christianity by many Christians, even throughout the reign of the apostasy. So you can see as, as early as, as the, uh, the, uh, the second or third century, <clears throat> some of the early Jewish witnesses, as well as some of the Arabian Christians, and now if we continue here, Anobius the Elder, Ephraim Ephra the Syrian, these are all Christian witnesses, Nasai, who was a, a Syrian Jew, Jacob is Sarol, and Abraham ben Ezra, another Jewish witness. Maimonides, one of the, one of the uh, foremost of the medieval rabbis, and Joseph Albo. And then we get to the, the, uh, the late medieval era and the early Middle Ages, when we start to look at Christian witnesses who held to this understanding. John Wycliffe, who wrote one of the earliest English translations of the Bible, Michael Sattler, William Tyndale, and even Martin Luther, all of them understood this understanding, this understanding that, that we have, that people are not innately mortal, that there is no immortal soul, and that immortality is granted to us at the return of Christ. As a result of the increased level of Bible study following the Reformation, this belief became increasingly widely held. It was held by the Anabaptists, for example, <clears throat> for, the, for the 200 years of, of their witness. And increasingly by more and more Christian scholars and Christian groups right up until the 19th century. So we can see that throughout that entire 1800 years, we can find this important doctrine of the mortality of man held widely and increasingly widely from the Reformation onwards right up until the 19th century. By the 19th century, it was becoming an increasingly well-recognized belief. And in fact, by the time of the 19th century, there were numerous groups in both England and North America which held this belief, including the, the Millerites, who became known later on as the Seventh-day Adventists, including also the people who became known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. So it's important to see that, that this belief in, in conditional immortality, the same understanding that we held, was in fact held all the way through that time, through that 1800 years of apostasy. And there's plenty of evidence for this, and this is widely acknowledged by all the professional historical literature. The doctrine of the Trinity, as we know, is one of the most dominant doctrines in Christianity. And since it was forged over years of controversy in the earliest years of Christianity, from the 2nd to the 4th centuries in particular, it has remained perhaps the most influential and for many people the most important doctrine of Christianity, at least Christianity so-called. And it's, it has been so dominant that it's extraordinarily difficult to find anybody during that 1800 years who actually even disputed this doctrine or held a different view. And one of the reasons for this was, unfortunately, once this doctrine became very firmly held, disobeying this doctrine was actually punishable by death. Sir Isaac Newton, for example, who held the same view of Jesus and God that we do ourselves, and who rejected the Trinity, actually kept his beliefs secret. And only a certain number of his friends actually really understood what he believed, because it was still a capital offence in England to disbelieve the doctrine of the Trinity. By the time that, even by the time that Isaac Newton was alive, it was still legal to be put to death for disputing the Trinity. So this doctrine was particularly pernicious in that it led people away from a true understanding of Jesus and a, a true understanding of God. It affected many other doctrines, such as the doctrine of the atonement, and it's very difficult to find people who believed otherwise. And yet, nevertheless, we can find even from the earliest Christian witnesses, we can find people who held the true understanding of God and a true understanding of Christ and who did not accept this, this doctrine. Of course, the doctrine of the Trinity was formed over many years and only came to its full fruition in about the 4th century. So, in fact, it's... It's surprisingly easier to find groups such as the Ebionites, the Nazarenes, and the Theodosians, and the Artemenites, who actually held a true understanding of God and Jesus right up until the 2nd and 3rd century. Up to the 3rd century, and especially the 4th century, after the church councils were convened, which started to put together the doctrine of the Trinity, it becomes a lot more difficult to find other, other Christians who held these beliefs. And there is what we might call, refer to as a period of darkness of understanding between the 3rd century and even the, the 15th century. 
We know that between this time there were other believers who, who did not un accept this doctrine, but it's extremely difficult to find hard evidence on them. We know that there, that there were other believers who did not accept the Trinity during this time, because occasionally we find reports of people who were put on trial for disbelieving the Trinity. But the information we have on them is, is very small, and it's extremely difficult to find out who they were and exactly what they did believe, even though they did, did dispute the Trinity. But we still can find, and this is extremely important, all the way back to the first and second centuries, we can find early Christians who held the same understanding of God and Christ that we do. And especially from the time of the Reformation, we can find increasingly a number of witnesses who no longer accepted the doctrine of the Trinity and who held the true understanding of God and Christ. And in fact, after the Reformation, this understanding became increasingly common, such such that by the 19th century, the doctrine of the Trinity was being openly challenged even by high-ranking theologians. And we can see some, some famous names here, or names perhaps which may not be uh, so familiar with you. Laelius Sakinus and Ferenc David. Laelius Sakinus, who was uh, one of the early founders of the Sakinian movement, that was a group of Christians which held many doctrines very, very similar to ours and, and many doctrines in common with us. Ferenc David, who was one of the, uh, the Polish brethren who were particularly influential and who held many doctrines in, in uh, common with us. And of course, uh, John Biddle and John Locke, two very influential Christians in England. Isaac Newton, whose understanding of the gospel was virtually the same as ours, and who also not only looked forward to the resurrection of the dead and, and who did not believe in the immortal soul, but also looked forward especially to the promises of Abraham and who predicted the return of the Jews to their land, even though this was only, not even a remote hope in his day and age. He predicted accurately the return of the Jews to their land, and he said, I, I don't even know how it's going to happen, or when it's going to happen, but the scriptures convince me that it's definitely going to happen sometime in the future, in God's own good time. So we can find, definitely throughout the history of Christianity, throughout that 1800 years of, of darkness, we can find witnesses to the true understanding of gos the, uh, the gospel, and the, especially the identity of Jesus and God. Now, if you're interested in additional information on this, I can provide you with it. I, I have some, some documents that I've written, some short one and two page documents which provide uh, a lot of quotations from historians of religion who can provide abundant evidence supporting these claims. And of course, there's, there's a lot of this information in my, in my book over there. I have about 20 or 30 pages uh, providing a lot of information about this. So if you want more information and you want to see the quotations from historians for yourself, I can provide that with you in various forms. It is remarkable that the, the doctrine of the atonement as we understand it was held throughout the ages of Christianity, even though that doctrine was darkened by the apostasy. Especially once the doctrine of the Trinity became popular, it was extremely difficult to regain a true understanding of the atonement, because of course once you believe that Jesus was God, then the entire doctrine of the atonement and the way in which Jesus was exactly like us becomes severely impaired. And nevertheless, Throughout Christianity, although they were small in number, we can still find witnesses to our understanding of the atonement, which, we, which is known in Christadelphian writings as the representative view or the participatory view of the atonement. Importantly, we can find a few early Christian witnesses who precede the date that the Trinity became popular. Clement of Rome, Clement of Alexandria, Oregon, and Arnobius the Elder, who also held the correct understanding of the mortality of man. And you will find that certain of these doctrines go hand in hand. People who rejected the immortal soul tended to have a much better understanding of the atonement. People who rejected the doctrine of the Trinity tended to have a much better understanding of the atonement. And this helps to demonstrate to us that the gospel is an integrated whole. And, the, and if you affect one area of the gospel, you necessarily damage other aspects of the gospel. And this helps us to understand why it's important to get it all right, and why all of these parts fit together. Because if you get some of these parts wrong, the others inevitably are affected. Of course, like the, uh, the doctrine of the, the true understanding of Christ, there was a time when the true understanding of the atonement was was obscured considerably for many, many years. 
and the doctrine of the penal substitution, that the idea that God punished Christ in order to take the punishment of our sins so that God was finally able to forgive us became dominant throughout the medieval era and the late Middle Ages. And so it took a very long time before the true understanding of the atonement was regained and we start to see it re-emerge. There may indeed have been some witnesses to the true understanding of the atonement between the 4th century and the 11th century, but if there were, they're extremely difficult to find, and it's very difficult to find any information on, on people who disbelieved the, uh, the church doctrine during this time, especially because it was so dangerous to profess such a belief. And nevertheless, we can find some prominent church writers during the late medieval era and the early Middle Ages. Peter Avalar, Peter Lombard, Dun Scotus, who were prominent medieval theologians and who were very, very well known and respected for their writings and caused a lot of controversy when they disputed the church's understanding of the, the, the atonement. And yet again, as we, we pass through the era of the Reformation, again we can find Laelius Lely, Sakinus and the Anabaptists coming to a correct understanding of the atonement because they already had a correct understanding of the mortal, mortality of man and they already had a correct understanding of the identity of God and Jesus and rejected the Trinity. So you can see, especially after the Reformation, when the true understanding of the Gospel began to re-blossom, and you'll find that, again, the Sakinians and the Anabaptists are some of our primary witnesses, and we find that they held a, almost identical beliefs to ourselves, and having, having gained a correct understanding of some of these beliefs, they were led to a correct understanding of others of these beliefs, because all these doctrines actually go together. During the 1800s, there was a movement called the Radical Reformation. That's actually a movement of Christianity to which we ourselves belong. Historians of religion place the Christadelphians within what is called the Radical Reformation. The Reformation of the, of the, 14th and, and, uh, of the 15th and 16th centuries has been called a limited reformation in that it was prepared to reject Catholic doctrine all the way back to the early church councils, back to, back to about the, the Council of Chalcedon and the, uh, the Council of Nicaea. However, the Radical Reformation was called the Radical Reformation because it was prepared to reject the doctrines of all the church councils and was attempting to go back all the way to the teachings of the apostles and insisted that if you could not find the doctrines in the Bible itself and in the early Christian witnesses of the first century, then it didn't matter how many church councils and how many bishops agreed, the radical reformers were prepared to, to turn over all the doctrines of, of men, all the church councils, because they only wanted to go back to the source of the original apostolic preaching. And that is the Christian movement to which our community, the Christadelphians, begin. We are part of the Radical Reformation, which was prepared to disregard all church authority, overturn all church councils, in order to regain a correct understanding of the Gospel as it was taught by the Apostles and, and as it was believed by the earliest Christian witnesses. So after the Radical Reformation, we find a correct understanding of the, of the Atonement began to, began to be widely held even among some prominent Theologians such as Horace Bushnell, Auguste Sabatier, and Hastings Rachdell, who was particularly influential in the 20th century in promoting this correct understanding of the atonement. Now, the doctrine of Satan and demons, as we know, is one of the most difficult doctrines to try and, and get people to understand. It is true that, that the Old and New Testament does represent some challenges in this area, and in order to gain a correct understanding of the doctrine of Satan and demons, we do need to do a lot of Bible study and we do need to do a lot of work. However, it is particularly to our advantage that we have a good number of historical witnesses that can demonstrate to us that historically our views concerning Satan and demons are not new. They are not something that we invented. And in fact, the fact that we have witnesses of earlier people, much, much earlier than ourselves, who read the Bible and came to the same understanding, proves that these are not twisted, twisted interpretations that we have stumbled across, or our own inventions. I'd like to now look outside the Bible to some of the Jewish books which were written during the time between the Testaments, during the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is called the intertestamental era, when many Jewish books were written, many religious books, some of them even claiming to have been written by inspired writers. 
However, the Jews themselves recognised that these books were not inspired and so they were not included in the Old Testament canon which was used by the Jews themselves. But what is remarkable is that many of these books, when we look at many of these books between this particular era, we find something incredible. We find many books here, uninspired books written by Jews, some of them even claiming to be inspired, but we know they weren't inspired, and they were, not, they were held as uninspired even by the Jews themselves. These are books written after the Babylonian captivity, right up to 170 years, five years before the time of Christ. What is remarkable about all these books is we don't find any mention of Satan in them. There's no supernatural devil here in any of these books. Now this is extraordinary because there are a lot of books here and many of them actually discuss issues such as the, the, uh, the question of temptation and sin. And in all the places where we would expect Satan and demons to appear, they're completely absent. This is remarkable because it shows that even right up to this time, this doctrine of Satan and demons was entirely absent from Jewish literature. And that demonstrates that we are not alone in reading the Old Testament and understanding that the traditional view of Satan and demons simply isn't there. We can prove it, because right up to 170 years before the time of Christ, even in all these books written by uninspired Jews, Satan is simply completely absent. He's just not there. And the reason why he's not there is because nobody believed in him. There's no supernatural devil or Satan here. Now, after a certain date, after about 160, so say 170 to 160 years before the time of Christ, suddenly we find Satan and demons begins to emerge. And we can trace this directly to a combination of Persian and Greek ideas which suddenly became imported into early Jewish thought. So suddenly, at a particular date, we start to find books written during the era when Jews became heavily influenced by Persian and especially by Greek thought, suddenly we start to find this idea of a supernatural Satan emerge. And even then, the evidence is very slight. And even then you can see here evidence of the formation of a doctrine. The Book of Jubilees, yes, that has a, a supernatural Satan. The book called The Wisdom of Solomon has one, but only, only mentioned once. The book called Slavonic Enoch, a, bo a book uh, purporting to have been written by Enoch, has a Satan who is not given a name and he's a fallen angel. The Apocalypse of Baruch does not actually have Satan at all. The third revision of the book of Enoch in the Slavonic version has a Satan, but it's not called Satan, he's called Satanael. The book called The Ascension of Isaiah has two kinds of Satan, two Satans, one called Belial and one called Samael. What's important here is we are seeing a great variety of ideas. And this is what happens when a doctrine is starting to be invented. You start to get different people coming to the same kind of ideas, but there's no standardization here. Sometimes Satan is a fallen angel, sometimes he's a demon, sometimes he's just an evil spirit. Sometimes he's called Satanael, sometimes he's called Samael, sometimes he's called Belial, sometimes there's only one Satan, sometimes there's two or three Satans. So because of this diversity of understanding, this diversity of belief, we can see here a doctrine, a new doctrine in the process of formation. And that proves conclusively that this doctrine was not believed by earlier Jews. That proves that Jews all the way up to about 175 BC had no understanding of this this new doctrine now being formed, this idea that there was a supernatural evil being called Satan, or maybe Belial, or maybe Satanael, or maybe Samael, maybe he was a fallen angel, maybe he was a demon, maybe it was, a, it was an evil spirit. At this point, there's no standardization. This doctrine is still being formed. In the book called The Life of Adam and Eve, yes, there's a Satan, but he's not mentioned uh, specifically by name. In the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, there's no Satan at all. In the Testament of Job, there is a Satan, and he's worshipped like an angel. And again, we find there's a curious mix of beliefs here, demonstrating that this belief was starting to be formed. So we can trace decisively the point at which this, this belief entered into Jewish thought. And we can prove that it was never there before. We've got, as you can see for yourself, we have around a 200 years 
of Jewish books written which don't contain any reference to Satan whatsoever. So we can prove that Jews, even the, after the Old Testament had been completed, didn't even hold this belief for at least 200 years. And that demonstrates that our belief is true. We can prove that other people did hold to this and they maintained a correct understanding of Satan even 200 years after the Old Testament was written. Now what is remarkable is that even after this doctrine of Satan and demons started to be formed, a correct understanding of Satan was still maintained by some of, some of the early Jewish writers and some of the early rabbis. So for example, in some of the early, the early Jewish writings, some of the early commentaries on the, uh, on the Bible, called the Targums and in some, some parts of the Talmud, especially Talmud Babylon, we find that there is no reference to Satan. Targum Palestine, which was a, a Jewish commentary on the Old Testament, doesn't have any reference to Satan. Targum Jerusalem, another very old commentary on the Old Testament, doesn't contain any reference to Satan. And most of Talmud Bob Babylon contains some reference to Satan, but other passages in Talmud, uh, in Talmud Babylon contain rabbis arguing against the existence of Satan. So, by the time we get to the second and fifth centuries, second and fifth centuries after the after the life of Christ, we do find a mix of beliefs. We find some rabbis do believe in the supernatural Satan, and some of them don't. And now there's some disagreement among them. But what's important is that we can find all the way up to the first century, we can still find Jewish believers who did not accept this doctrine of Satan and demons. They did not accept a supernatural evil being called Satan and they did not accept a, a belief in demons. And that's important because that means we can prove that at the time of Christ there were Jewish believers who did not hold that understanding. And that means we can count the apostles among them. And we can continue to, to look at this and we can find we can find that throughout the earliest Jewish witnesses after the first century, we can still find this belief being held. From the first century, Jonathan Point ben Uthio, and then the second century, Joshua ben Kaha, and Simeon ben Ben Lachish in the, in the third century, Ben Isaac in the fourth century, Judah in the fifth century, and in fact throughout the medieval era, and, and some of the greatest rabbis, Kimchi, Maimonides in particular, and Ben Gershon, known as Gersonides, and Isaac Abravanel, these are some of the most prominent of the, uh, of the me medieval and, and early Middle Ages rabbis, and they, all of them rejected this traditional understanding of Satan and demons. They did not believe in a supernatural de devil. They did not believe in supernatural demons and evil spirits. That's extremely important because we can see that these men who are looking at the Old Testament did not find that belief there. And these men all, as we can see, preceded the modern era by some centuries. This is not a belief that we have invented. This was a belief which was held even during this time. Even when the doctrine of Satan and demons, the supernatural Satan and demons, had become prevalent among Jewish thought, there was still significant witness of the correct understanding. Now, in the Christian era, this doctrine became very firmly entrenched and it's much more difficult to find early Christian witnesses to this doctrine. And yet after the Reformation, when, when many doctrines were opposed, when the traditional doctrines were opposed, we start to find that Christian commentators reject this belief. Thomas Hobbes was one of the earliest Christian writers to reject the belief in a supernatural devil and demons. Balthazar Becker, a, a Dutch commentator, also rejected it. And we can find many, we start to find many Christian commentators, including of course our old favourite, Sir Isaac Newton, who rejected this doctrine of supernatural devil and demons. So we can see that these Christians all the way down to the 19th century, a long time before Brother Thomas, actually rejected this doctrine of Satan and demons. So we can see this is not a belief held that, that we have invented, that Brother Thomas suddenly came along and decided that he was going to make up. This is not a belief that we have invented. All these men, men these different men are living in different areas, living in different countries, in different ages, and in different times and places. These men came to this same understanding by themselves. And they didn't simply copy each other. Some of these men were, were writing independently. They weren't aware of the, the, the books that other people were writing. And they all looked and studied the Bible for themselves, the Old and New Testament. And they came to the same understanding that we as Christians hold. 
So we can be firm in our conviction that these doctrines that, that we hold, these unique doctrines, which seem very marginal in Christianity, are not doctrines that we have invented. There is a, a clear witness that other Christians have also looked at the Bible by themselves and come to an, an independent conclusion and reached the same understanding as ourselves. So we can find earlier Christian and even Jewish witnesses to the same understanding of these doctrines as ourselves. And that gives us good hope that, as Brother Thomas and Brother Robert said, true beliefs were held during that 1800 years of apostasy. And it is true that the Bible is sufficient unto itself to grant people a correct understanding of the gospel. And even though these true believers were few in number, and even though in many cases, even their understanding of the gospel may have been clouded, was partial or, or somewhat murky, it was possible for true believers to gain an accurate understanding of the gospel during that time of the apostasy. And we can also see that these doctrines that we held were not invented by Brother Thomas, were not invented by Brother Roberts. Other Christians, much earlier than ourselves, had read the Bible and come to them independently by themselves. That's very important because it does demonstrate that what we understand from the Bible is not simply some doctrines that we have held and then indoctrinated ourselves to believe. These doctrines, these understandings of the scripture were held by many different Christians and they were arrived at independently. And that's very important to help us, to help reassure us that we are right. Now, what I'd like to show to you in the last section of this presentation is what modern Christian theologians are saying. And we might ask ourselves, well, well really, given that for 1800 years, Theologians, and especially the professional theologians and the, the men of the se seminary and the, the men of the theological academies, given that all these men have traditionally been opposing our beliefs, why would we be interested in modern scholarly theological literature? Why would we be interested in what modern theologians have to say about the Bible? Well, we should be interested because it's a simple fact that now modern theologians, including the the highest and best regarded theologians in, in modern scholarship have started significantly to move to a correct understanding of the gospel and they are writing pages and pages upholding Christadelphian belief. And I'd like to show that to you now. And that's an extremely important witness which we really need to be using in our own public preaching. Let's have a look now at what standard Bible commentaries and leading theologians say on the subject of human mortality. Edmund's Bible Dictionary, a standard work, written all the way back in 1987. Indeed, the salvation of the immortal soul has sometimes been a common has been a commonplace in preaching, but it is fundamentally unbiblical. That's a standard Bible commentary which you can find in Christian bookshops today, and it's telling you bluntly that the doctrine of the immortal soul is fundamentally unbiblical. In another Bible dictionary, in 19, 3rd edition in 1996, but to the Bible, man is not a soul in a body, but a body-soul unity. So true this is that even in the resurrection, although flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, we shall still have bodies. And you, if you read the entire article here, entitled Dualism, it is arguing directly against the idea that man is a dual being, that we have an immortal soul and a mortal body. And again, this is a standard Bible dictionary. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the Revised Edition, edition of, uh, published in 2002, one of the most well-known and widely respected Bible encyclopedias, says bluntly, a disembodied existence in Sheol, a disembodied existence in the grave, is unreal, doesn't exist. And again, another Standard Bible Dictionary written in 2011, the Tyndale Bible Dictionary, there is no suggestion in the Old Testament of the transmigration of the soul as an immaterial, immortal entity. Simply doesn't exist. Now, as a result of this dramatic transformation of beliefs, as a result of this, this sudden realisation by modern theologians that this whole doctrine of the immortal soul, which has been taught for so long, is now completely unbiblical, other false doctrines are also starting to fall. Of course, once you have no immortal soul, then you have no heaven going, and then you have no hell. And in fact, hell is a doctrine which has been increasingly opposed throughout the 20th century, and now many notable theologians are starting to challenge and abandon this belief. 
And here are just a few from 1940 onwards. In fact, it may, may uh, interest you to know that the Anglican Church, one of the largest of the Christian churches, one of the largest of the formal Christian churches, abandoned its belief in the immortal soul formally in the 1940s. It's remarkable, perhaps, that, that we haven't actually heard, heard more about this. But that's exactly the kind of thing that we ought to be using in our preaching. Now, it is remarkable that we are no longer marginal in Christianity, that modern theologians are starting in large numbers to move across to the belief that we have always held. This is incredibly good news, brothers and sisters, because we can say in the nicest possible way, we told you so. And what we really need to do is that we, it, it doesn't just prove that what we said all along is that true Bible believers can look at the Bible for themselves and gain a correct understanding. And now we can, we, can give, we can use these modern theologians. We can give respect to these men who, despite being in churches which have traditionally taught these beliefs, we can respect these men for their honesty. They've looked in the Bible and, say, and said things like, I'm sorry, the doctrine of the immortal soul is fundamentally unbiblical. And so as a result now, the doctrine of hell is now, is now under fire. In fact, uh, a recent book uh, written by uh, some evangelicals, some traditional evangelicals in, in the last 10 years was entitled Hell Under Fire. Now, now the doctor, these traditional doctrines are becoming challenged because once you start toppling over doctrines like the immortal soul, it ine inevitably other doctrines must give way. The doctrine of hell must give way. The doctrine of heaven going must give way. And then you start to look at the doctrine of the atonement in a different way. And these are some, uh, these are some, some, some significant modern theologians. Edward Fudge, Clark Pinnock, John Stott, Philip Hughes, Michael Green, names not known to you perhaps, but these are leading theologians. When some of these theologians came out and, and said they were abandoning the doctrine of hell, there was immense consternation among modern evangelicals in particular. Some of these are leading theologians who have enormous influence. And for them to abandon these beliefs and say, I'm sorry, I've been wrong all these years, is, has sparked a dramatic change in modern Christianity. And we need to be aware of this. And we need to be using this in our public preaching. No longer are we some weird little marginal sect having funny ideas. Now, modern theologians are starting to come to exactly the same conclusions that we are. Ironically, as the Bible is being studied more professionally now, and theologians are allowed to study it without being shackled by having to same, come to the same conclusions as their church, now modern theologians are coming to exactly the same beliefs that we have held all along. And there's another reason why this is important, brothers and sisters, and that is because there has been immense pressure over the last 150 years or so of our community. There has been immense pressure on us to give way on our doctrines, to give ground. There has been immense pressure, even by some Christadelphians, to say, look, you know, how can we be right? How can we be right and millions, not just thousands, but millions of other Christians be wrong? How can we be right when the best of the theologians of the modern age still hold these beliefs? Shouldn't we really at least give ground on some of these issues? Shouldn't we accept that some of our beliefs aren't really that important and maybe we can have fellowship with these other churches? Shouldn't we really sort of acknowledge that maybe they are right and we are the ones who are wrong? Well, you know now, brothers and sisters, this really puts an end to that entire argument. We were right all along and mainstream theology is now starting to acknowledge this. And wouldn't it have been horrifically embarrassing if we had given way in those earlier years, in the middle of the, of the 20th century? Wouldn't it have been horrifically embarrassing if we had started to say, yeah, well, okay, maybe, wait, maybe we're not so smart after all. Maybe we don't have a correct understanding. Maybe we need to start listening to these guys. Maybe we should lower our, 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 um, our, doctrines, our doctrinal basis of fellowship, and maybe we should start accepting that, that maybe the doctrine of the immortal soul is correct. Maybe we're wrong on the atonement. It would have been horrifically embarrassing if we'd done that, only to face this recent emergence of theologians suddenly swinging over to our views. And it really does demonstrate that, as we have always said, people who study the Bible with an unbiased view, unshackled by church dogma, can find the truth for themselves. Now let's have a look at the identity of God and Jesus. And we start to find again in the professional theological commentary some really remarkable statements. Jesus is never called God in the Synoptic Gospels, says this standard introduction to the New Testament. And again, Jesus did not understand himself as a divine figure. Nowhere in the letters did Paul call Jesus God. This is, this is remarkable, isn't it? These are mainstream theologians writing in standard Bible dictionaries, which are now being read by hundreds and thousands of Christians. And they're coming to exactly the same conclusions as we are. 
And now Bart Ehrman, one of our, one of our favourite agnostics, comes and weighs in heavily. He, of course, has, has no particular reason to, to support our views. He's not even a Christian anymore. And yet he's a remarkably useful man. That the earliest Christians did not consider Jesus God is not even a controversial point among scholars. Apart from fundamentalists and some very conservative evangelicals, scholars are unified in thinking that the view that Jesus was God was a later development within Christian circles. And there you have it, brothers and sisters. The doctrine of the Trinity now has no solid foundation whatsoever among modern scholarship. That's an extremely important quotation. And you can find abundant evidence demonstrating this. As, and I've provided just a few, more, a few quotations, and I have many more quotations in my book over there. And I can send you, uh, send you small documents um, by email, if you like, showing you these facts. That the earliest Christians did not consider Jesus God is not a controversial point among scholars. Apart from fundamentalists and some very conservative evangelicals, scholars are unified in thinking that the view that Jesus was God was a later development within Christian circles. And there you have it. And this is the kind of information we really need to be using in our public preaching. We really need, we really need to be rejoicing that modern scholarship is increasingly on our side. And now we have, brothers and sisters, many people in churches around us who are extremely wide and they're disturbed and they're unsettled because the church they've been in all this time has been taught, teaching them wrongly and they are looking for an alternative and we are the alternative and we need to be finding these people and welcoming them, welcoming them into our community. And now let's have a look at the Doctrine of the Atonement which Christadelphians have traditionally referred to as representative. Well, what are modern scholars saying now? Most scholars today accept the view that the death of Christ is representative, exactly the same term that we have always used. And let's have a look at just a, a few of the mainstream scholars, especially in recent years, who have been promoting this doctrine. Molly Marshall in 1994, Stephen Finlan, one of the very influential uh, scholars in, in the current era, James Dunn, an Anglican scholar has an immense influence uh, among Anglican circles and is widely recognised as one of the authorities of the New Testament and the letters of Paul. Marcus Borg, European scholar of enormous regard and influence. And these are heavyweights, brothers and sisters, these are heavyweights in mainstream theology and they're all swinging around to the same view of the atonement that we have always taught and that we have always preached. And this is really remarkable. This is extremely good news for us. And again, let's have a look at, at what some of these scholars are saying. And we'll find that they are using language which we, as Christadelphians, have always used. Look at this language. When Paul writes here that one died for all, and therefore all died, he does not mean that Christ died instead of, or in the place of all. Rather, the meaning of hupa, the Greek word used here, seems to be controlled by the idea of representation or participation, the very language which Christadelphians have always used. And again, Dunn, a famous Anglican scholar, says, but Paul's teaching is not that Christ dies in the place of others so that they escape death, as the logic of substitution implies. It is rather that Christ's sharing their death makes it possible for them to share his death. Participation, which is the key word which we have always used. So, the key understanding now, being held by mainstream theologians on the doctrine of the opponent, is summarised by these words, representation or participation. Participatory atonement is the term which is now used in modern, by modern scholarship. Participatory atonement is the, is the term that is now being used by mainstream theologians to describe the Bible's understanding of the atonement. Now let's have a look at where we can find that term, participatory atonement. Where we can find it? of course, in the earliest Christadelphian literature. Particip participation in those means, 1870. These are all quotations from the Christadelphian magazine in uh, speaking about the atonement. Participation in those means, morally participate in, participation in the one great sacrifice, a participation in his death, our participation now, our participation in his life, participation in his crucifixion. We participate in his life. Now, that's a survey of Christ articles in the Christadelphian magazine from over 120 years, and it demonstrates that we have maintained the same view of the atonement throughout all the controversies. We have still maintained our same view of the atonement all the way through that time, through, through 120 years and more. 
and we've even used this term participation. And now, incredibly, ironically, this is the very term being used by modern theologians to describe the atonement. And modern theologians are now describing the atonement no longer as substitution, but in exactly the same terms as we have always understood it. And this is remarkably welcome news. And again, we really need to be using this in our public preaching. And now look at, let's look at that heavyweight doctrine. Let's look at the subject of Satan and demons. Now, we might find it remarkable and extraordinary, and yes it is, but it is actually true that in mainstream theological scholarship, it is now beginning to be accepted that this traditional doctrine of Satan and demons is horribly wrong, and we really have to do something about it. And let me, let me give you some information about how, where this all started. In the 19th century, I do keep doing that, in the 19th century, <clears throat> Christian theologians began openly questioning the existence of Satan. The 19th century was a very good time for religious renewal, and as a result of the radical reformation of which we were a part, modern theologians started questioning a lot of the orthodox beliefs. And now what do we find modern theologians say? Well, let's have a look. Brueggemann, one of the premier European theologians, extremely influential. The Old Testament itself offers none of the material through which Satan emerges as the popular figure of, tem of the tempter and devil. He's just not there. A standard Bible commentary published in 2012. Contrary to popular thinking, for the ancient Israelites, this figure was not the personification of evil, the arch nemesis of God. This view developed in later Judaism and Christianity, as we've seen from our historical review. In 1995, the Anglican theologian Caird wrote, Most of the material in the New Testament concerning Satan appears in the form of myth. And it's important to understand how theologians use these words. When Caird uses the word myth, he's not saying something which isn't true. He's saying they used symbolic language, which is exactly the, the, the same understanding that we have. And it is a matter of some delicacy, he says rather politely, to determine how far the New Testament writers took their language literally. So Caird himself, well aware that he is challenging the doctrines of his own church, is saying, you know, we have to be really careful about exactly how literally the New Testament writers intended us to read their language, given that they were writing in symbolic language. Dunn and Tolstoy, of course, Dunn, one of the most uh, influential and famous of the Anglican theologians, and Twelfthree, who has spent a lot of time on the subject of Satan and demons in the New Testament, and as a result of his studies, especially his study on demons, his understanding of Satan and demons in the New Testament has started to shift dramatically from his, from his early years, because he can see the New Testament doctrine of Satan and demons just isn't exactly what he was taught. Looking at the cases of demon possession in the New Testament, they acknowledge some of the cases of demon possession in the Gospels can be demythologized, at least to some extent, by which they mean we must understand them as using symbolic language. In particular, in the case of Mark 9, 14 to 26, it may well be that we should recognize the signs of epilepsy and recategorize it accordingly. In other words, we, we shouldn't just be looking at these as the right New Testament writers are saying, oh, this man was possessed by a demon. Rather, we should understand the New Testament writers to be using figurative language, symbolic language, and the language of their day to refer to people who had illnesses such as epilepsy. And again, a, uh, a Jewish writer here commenting on the temptation of Christ says, Second, the confrontation with Satan could be seen as Jesus' struggle with himself and overcoming the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, part of all men, and which is externalized in the literature by the figure of Satan. So here's, here's a Jewish commentator looking at the Gospel's account of the temptation of Christ in the wilderness and saying, you know, you don't really need to read this as, as Jesus being tempted by an external figure. You don't need to read this as Jesus being tempted by a supernatural a supernatural devil. Rather, you could read this as Jesus being struggling with his own internal temptations, struggling with his own inclination to do wrong. And then we have here Caird and Kelly putting, this, putting, the, uh, the, uh, some, putting out some very blunt statements. To many in the early church, Satan was undoubtedly a person, but to others he may well have been just a personification. 
And Kelly comes out bluntly and says, we've already discussed what Paul thought of demons, namely he considered them to be lifeless idols. He didn't believe that they were supernatural evil beings. So what I, I have shown you this morning, and what I th hope you can really appreciate, is that firstly, our doctrines have been held historically by other Christians throughout that 1800 years or so of apostasy. Throughout that time of darkness, it is possible to find, and this has been well acknowledged by many professional historians, other believers who looked at the Bible for themselves, who were prepared to challenge church doctor, doctrine, church councils, and church uh, dogmas, and who found the truth for themselves. Yes, their understanding was still cloudy and murky in many, in many ways, and yes, perhaps some of them did not manage to recover the entire gospel for themselves. Nevertheless, it is true that our doctrines do have a historical witness which proves that we did not invent them ourselves and that they were not unique, and that, as we have always said, the Bible is sufficient witness unto itself to teach people the true understanding of the Scriptures. We've also seen that now, indeed, modern theologians are increasingly supporting our beliefs, and this is immensely good news for us. Not only does that mean we do not need to bow the knee to the church councils, we do not need to indulge in, in ecumenical gatherings which weaken our stance and which weaken our witness for the true gospel. It also means that we now have available to us extremely powerful weapons to preach, brothers and sisters, extremely powerful weapons. Because those theologians we, who we have been told always to respect and revere are now saying exactly what we have said all along. And now we need to start finding those people who are worried, who are concerned, who are disturbed and confused that their churches have been wrong all along. We need to find those people and reach out to them and say, well, there is an alternative. There has always been an alternative, and we are the alternative. And we need to demonstrate that now that, yes, it is true, the Bible does stand by itself. And the very fact that modern theologians now are, are overwhelmingly start to, to starting to come over to our beliefs does prove that we were right all along. And we do need to say that in the nicest possible way. But it's true. It is actually true. We were right all along. And now we have the most powerful weapon imaginable that we could use because even though people may not accept our personal view of the Bible maybe they won't accept our pamphlets our leaflets maybe they won't uh, accept us even sitting down and trying to show to them with the concordance why that word doesn't mean what it seems to mean now we have a new arsenal a devastating array of weapons we have the, the, the greatest and the brightest theologians we have all of this arsenal at our disposal and we really need to use it we need to prove that to people that now our witness of, of the true gospel now has been is being overwhelmingly accepted and that now we can really start to preach anew i believe we can start to preach in new ways and reach out and prove to people that that it is possible for them to study the bible by themselves gain the same understanding that we have we can show them the earlier historical witnesses and in particular we can show them the modern witnesses and encourage them to come to a correct understanding of the gospel for themselves